go ahead and start off with just a little bit of summary about kind of where we're at, what we're up to, um, in case that's interesting for folks. Um, and then we can just go ahead to questions. I have an hour blocked out for this and we'll see how it goes. And if this works well, then maybe we'll stick to this format and do it again. Um, and if not, maybe we'll, you know, see if, if there's a different structure to use. So, um, and it looks like a lot of people are still joining. So maybe I'll actually give people another couple minutes to join before I kind of talk through a brief summary. So actually, um, I'm curious to know where are people listening in from? If people want to um, actually just say, you know, are you in Europe? Are you in North America? What, where are you? New York City! Woo! <laughs> nice. Europe. Europe? Okay. Europe. Europe. Okay. Ah, nice. Where where was that? England. England. Okay. More England here. All right. Ah, nice. So we're hearing uh, excited Dutch children this morning, or this afternoon. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, okay, great. So thanks folks for, for sharing where you're at. It gives me a sense of who I'm speaking to. Um, so in brief, um, what we're up to you know, at the very end of this year, what we're thinking about, um, just to start us off. So as I've shared a little bit before, um, we're at a stage right now where the initial um, community that started to use our app in Venezuela and Argentina is going really strong. You can kind of see that a little bit if you look at our Spanish speaking Twitter account. We just hit 10,000 followers in Venezuela mainly in Venezuela. Um, a lot of those accounts are from Venezuela. Some are from Argentina and some are from the rest of Latin America, but it's predominantly Venezuela. Um, and that's totally organic. So, you know, as you can see from our posts there, we're really, really active. So there's definitely an, a marketing effort there to engage people and build that community. Um, you know, so we have a lot of followers who haven't gotten to use the app yet, who are still on the wait list. Um, and so we're kind of building the community in advance. Um, but we haven't purchased any ads for that. So that 10,000 number gives you a kind of a good representation of how many people have showed up and are interested in what we're doing, at least enough to follow us on social media and engage from time to time. Um, similarly, we've had a pretty good experience so far growing an initial community on TikTok, um, which, which has been a, an interesting, interesting adventure. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, I encourage you to go check out our Spanish language TikTok. It's really engaging and, and smart. Um, and we have, I think, over 40,000 followers on TikTok, even though we've been doing it for less time than Twitter. Um, and that's sort of helped generate interest in what we're doing in Venezuela and Latin America as well. So um, at this point, the app itself, as I've mentioned, um, ha is like not fully scalable. What does that mean? That means that some of the processes that are involved technologically and logistically in terms of like what our staff um, has to do behind the scenes to operate the app itself um, are are basically just not ready to take on you know hundreds of thousands or millions of users um, and i'll give a couple examples of what that means um, so for instance when someone makes a deposit to their reserve account with say venezuelan boulevards um, that bank transfer is uh, fielded by a human, like a human actually, some human somewhere that's part of our system um, actually sees that money having been transferred and clicks a button in our um, backend web application in order to credit that user their reserve dollars. Um, and similarly, if you're making um, a, a withdrawal, there's also a human process involved in that. We're in the middle of automating that right now. So actually this week, we just started testing um, in production, like actually for uh, live transactions that our users are doing, an automated version of that. Um, and so we've done some automation work with some of the, the banks that we support, and there's more automation work to be done as well. Um, it's also the case that 
uh, there's a complicated pricing negotiation that has to happen for those currency conversions, right? Because people are trading effectively in and out of US dollars from these other different currencies. And so um, when we recently spoke about uh, the reserve exchange that we're building, um, that's gonna be built into the app, that's part of making that sort of pricing and an overall process more scalable. So let me just try to say what that means. Um, so effectively, you know, if you're a liquidity provider who's helping people cash in or cash out from their reserve app, um, you're gonna be doing that at some price. Um, there'll be a cash in price and a cash out price. Um, and right now we have uh, a very formidable team member who does a bunch of manual negotiations with our liquidity providers, with our payment processors, I should say, um, each morning in order to negotiate those prices and then also throughout the day as necessary to update those prices because we're talking about a volatile currency. Um, and so the Reserve app already functions as a very basic exchange, but we have imagined a more complicated way, a more sort of uh, intelligent way for that exchange process to work that's a little bit more like a crypto exchange with something like limit orders um, and market orders and so on, although it's uh, it works a little bit differently for various reasons. I guess I won't go into that now, but um, we've had to think about it a bit from, from the ground up because it's not just a copy paste of a normal crypto exchange mechanism. So those are two technological pieces that we have in the works right now where the, the bank transaction automation is already uh, further along in development. Like I said, that's being tested in production as of this week. Um, and the um, crypto, the, 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 the exchange mechanism that will automate um, a bunch of the details about that pricing and, and the, the trades that happen when people are cashing in and cashing out, that is in the architecture phase. So we've explored different options as a team. Um, me and our CTO have spent significant time on it together um, and we've settled on an overall plan and we're to the point where now that's being um, architected by the technical team um, and we'll get into development in January. Um, and so essentially, you know, I think a big question in a lot of people's minds is like, okay, cool. Well, so how, how soon are we going to see um, significant growth in uh, the app usage? And so really it's, it's a, uh, it comes down to, well, how, how quickly can we get those pieces in place and a couple of other pieces around scalability? There's some, um, some things that we'll end up getting to in a couple of months about upgrading our KYC process to make it easier to get through that so that we can onboard many more users per day um, than we easily could right now. Um, so one, once we get through a number of those steps, um, it will sort of be in a, in a nice situation where at that point, the bottleneck is just how quickly can we entice people to join. Um, and so as we mentioned, we have a, a growing wait list um, where we're keeping, we're keeping our mouths shut about the number, but we're excited about the number of people who've signed up on that wait list. Um, and, um, and like I said, we have you know, a lot of interest in these communities, so we are optimistic that um, this transition from closed beta to um, you know, allowing people to uh, invite others and, uh, and try to grow as fast as possible will go well, um, starting over the next you know, couple of months. Um, and so then really the goal for 2021 at this point, it's, it's pretty exciting for me personally and for the team, um, we're getting to the point where the goal really is going to be growth as fast as we can um, because we feel like we have seen enough to be pretty comfortable that the version of the app that we've worked out um, in terms of its functionality uh, really is something that is quite valuable for a very large population um, in in Venezuela in particular, and we think we can adapt it um, in Argentina, although I would say that we're earlier on in that market and understanding the details. And um, I, I think we're not as confident yet in exactly what needs to be presented to really reach a larger audience. Um, and of course, with all these statements, you know, we could be wrong. Like you never really know 100% until you've actually gotten the millions of users, right? So um, we have to look at the evidence that we have and make our, our judgment calls and, and we've done that and we've decided, okay, we're excited about this. We're going to work on making this scalable. We're no longer gonna be spending most of our time, you know, tinkering with and shifting the product and, and you, know, um, you know, just like trying to understand users and, and iterating. We feel like we've sort of reached a good point where like, okay, at this point, we really do wanna make it scalable and, and grow as fast as we can in 2021. When it comes to the question of, well, how much can you grow in a year? In startups like this, 
it's such a wide range of possibilities. You know, you look at um, PayPal as an example, and you know, in, in their first few months after launching their initial uh, PayPal product, you know, they ended up onboarding millions of users, which was really a fantastic uh, growth story. And in that case, it was paid. Um, you know, they had a large monetary incentive for people to join, uh, but that was quite effective and, and it turned out to be a good move. So you can get those sorts of situations where you get you know, millions of people joining relatively quickly. In other cases, um, you can have slower, you know, more organic growth, um, and that can be the right thing to do. And at this point, like, I don't have a specific uh, goal or a specific sort of um, projection that I want to put out there, um, but we're definitely thinking a lot internally about how to approach growth. And obviously, if we can, we want it to be as fast as possible in 2021. Um, we just have to make sure that we don't let it get out of hand and grow too fast because that can be damaging um, to uh, a situation like this. So that's kind of the, the basic summary. Um, uh, let's go ahead and open it up for some questions. So again, there's no rules here, um, but please try to be civil. Don't, you know, let's not all talk over each other. Um, and um, I won't answer 100% of questions. There's some questions that I just think are better to not um, talk about in public. So I'll use my judgment, but you're welcome to ask anything you like. Hi, Nevin. Can I start off? Go for it. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. We appreciate it. Can you maybe share a little insight on the arbitrage and what kind of percentages you'd, you'd be expecting to uh, earn in RSV? Sure. So arbitrage you know I'll, I'll say this i'll start from the the beginning for anyone who um, hasn't researched this or, or doesn't know exactly what we're talking about here so arbitrage refers to the process of um, when rsv is above or below its peg um, in the more evolved version of our protocol um, which we will be launching sometime this year um, users can basically take advantage of that in order to earn money and they can do that in a couple of different ways depending on conditions so um, the particular condition um, that i think barry is referring to is if rsv is trading above a dollar and if the protocol has um, captured rsv in essentially revenue um, and and if there's a pool of rsv that the protocol is holding um, from those proceeds then rsr holders can actually go and use their RSR to purchase those RSV. Um, and you can, you'd can purchase them in expectation for about a dollar worth of RSR. That would happen in an auction, but that's the expected price to settle around a dollar. And then you could turn around and sell those RSV for um, some, some amount of profit, right? Because the idea is if, if RSV is trading above a dollar, let's say it's trading at a dollar one, um, then you purchase them for a dollar worth of RSR, you turn around and sell them for a dollar one worth of whatever, um, you know, could be RSV or, or, uh, or well, no, it wouldn't be RSV. You, you sell it for some other cryptocurrency on another exchange, or you could sell it for fiat uh, currency on another exchange. The idea is that um, that process brings the price of RSV on the secondary markets back down to a dollar, because if everyone is rushing to buy it for a uh, dollar worth of RSR from the protocol, and then go and sell it on secondary markets to earn that instant 1% profit. Um, you know, the more that people do that, the more people sell on those other exchanges. And as everyone knows, um, that would bring the price down by moving uh, the orders on the books on those other exchanges. So, um, and so the, the question that Barry is asking is, okay, if someone is um, an RSR holder and they participate in that process, um, then, you know, sort of what numbers are we talking about there? What could happen? So there's a further distinction that I want to go ahead and point out, which is there are kind of two different ways that you can engage in that process. You can engage in that process of arbitrage by purchasing RSR at the, at the same moment or just before um, you perform that arbitrage loop. Um, or you could be someone who has purchased RSR in advance um, and held it and then chosen to go and spend the RSR at that time. Um, and so if you purchase it right then and there, then your cost basis for a dollar worth of RSR is a dollar. So you would buy a dollar worth of RSR, you you know exchange it for one RSV, um, and then you go sell the RSV for a dollar one. And in that case, um, you would 
just profit that, that one cent. You just profit from the arbitrage. But you could also have held RSR that you purchased at a, a lower cost basis. So maybe the dollar worth of RSR, it could be that you had uh, paid you know, 50 cents for that RSR. And then when you trade it in, um, you have the gain that you've earned from uh, speculating on the RSR as well as um, that one uh, cent of gain that you would get um, from purchasing RSV and then going and selling it. So, so I, forgive me, Barry, for giving a long answer here. It's just that there's there's some points here that I think are useful to try to clarify and help educate the community about. Um, and um, some of our admins will probably be converting some of this into uh, written AMA material. So hopefully we can reach a wide audience and, and have this be a useful explanation. Um, so then there's the question of, okay, well, how often does that arbitrage opportunity present itself for RSR holders in particular? Um, so, uh, and, and that's really a function of, well, how often is there an RSV pool sitting there from the protocol having collected revenue? Um, and then that <laughs> is dependent on, well, how many RSV are in circulation? Um, what is, it, it could depend on the velocity of RSV if the protocol is collecting a transfer fee at that time. Um, and um, it also will just generally depend on um, which revenue mechanisms have been integrated into the protocol and turned on. And so um, there are, there's roughly three available revenue mechanisms for the reserve protocol. Um, one is for the protocol to essentially earn money just from holding collateral assets where the, uh, the, the tokenized collateral issuers would pay the protocol um, a portion of their proceeds in exchange for having a larger slice of that RSV portfolio, of that RSV collateral portfolio. So for instance, you know, Coinbase and, and Circle will offer um, people a certain uh, amount of yield just for purchasing USDC and holding it in an account. Why do they do that? Well, they do that because they can earn some amount of yield on that money in the bank. And so they're willing to split that um, with, with consumers um, or with businesses um, in exchange to increase the amount of deposits and increase the amount of money that they're making. In theory, um, and I, I believe in practice, that will end up happening on the protocol level as well. So um, uh, token issuers like that, I believe, will end up being in competition and offering an amount of their, of their revenue to the protocol itself in exchange for having um, a larger fraction. That's number one. Number two is a transaction fee. And on this topic, there's really, you know, for predicting a transaction fee, it's like, I think it really depends on what the crypto market overall settles on in terms of um, the fees that people end up paying for stable coins in the long term. And so the way you can think about that is like, well, if um, centralized stablecoin issuers can make enough money just on the yield, um, then maybe there'll be enough competition that they won't charge transaction fees above and beyond gas. And if that's the case, then the reserve token probably also won't have a, a transaction fee or won't have a significant transaction fee um, because it needs to stay competitive. But if the industry does end up charging fees because of the fact that there isn't another available revenue mechanism for the centralized token issuers, um, then the reserve uh, protocol fee will will likely mirror that. That's my prediction. Um, and then the third is uh, over collateralized lending, similar to what we see in DeFi. So essentially, um, you could have a situation where uh, participants could come and borrow the collateral assets from the protocol um, if they over collateralize with some other volatile crypto asset that they lock up, similar to Compound. Um, and uh, and so then there could be uh, an amount of yield generated um, based on whatever the market rate is for borrowing those collateral assets. Why am I saying this long, complicated answer? Well, because the percentage, um, you know, the, the, the amount of RSV revenue that's available is dependent on all these different variables. And I want to try to give people that deeper understanding instead of just a point estimate, which could potentially be wrong. So um, practically speaking, in the short term, like in 2021, um, you know, we, we intended to the mainnet launch in 2021, 
and we intend for these mechanisms to be in, in, included in that. And so that's when you'd start having the ability to use your RSR in the arbitrage process. But the overall numbers will probably be pretty small at that point, right? Because we're still, we're talking about, um, you know, likely a total RSV market cap that isn't, you know, super high, that's not going to be, you know, in the billions in 2021. Um, it could be pretty small. It, it could it could start to get to an impressive number, but it's still not going to be something enormous. Um, and then uh, also, uh, we may or may not have included all of those revenue mechanisms at the very beginning, because from our perspective, you know what really matters in terms of the economics of the protocol um, are the the long term success, the long term growth and adoption of RSV, um, and and then you know, like many, you know, even like a, like a normal company, even though we're not a normal company, like a normal company, it makes sense at this point to really focus on um, making the product work and getting massive adoption, and then start to think more about the monetization of all of it later. Um, and so I personally uh, don't anticipate that there would be um, like really significant gains or really significant incentives um, for RSR arbitrage in 2021, although we will start to see the mechanism exist and be usable, um, albeit on a smaller scale. And so I think that the the motivation for people to hold RSR throughout 2021, you know, they'll, they'll get some interaction with um, this arbitrage process, and that will be interesting and educational. Um, but I don't think it's going to be the case that the amount of like APY is going to be massively competitive with other like yield farming schemes where people are giving away huge amounts of their token, you know, all in like one week or one month of time. Um, those those APYs, um, w I think, would be difficult to compete with at this early stage where um, where, you know, we're not giving away a massive amount of value um, for no reason. So I hope that helps um, fill in the background, Barry. Yeah, Nevin, thank you so much. I just want to thank you again for taking the time. And uh, yeah, thank you again. You're welcome. When uh, will uh, mainnet launch? Popular question, when will mainnet launch? So um, I am planning that out. Um, and what one thing I've learned is if I say or if we say um, a specific time or, or even, a, even a general um, guess like a particular quarter, um, then people will come to have a very strong expectation about it happening exactly at that time. Um, and a lot of people will be let down. So unfortunately, I'm not going to give any answer to that. Um, we're definitely aiming to do it in 2021. Um, and uh, we're working through the details of what that's going to look like. What I will say is that the biggest factor I think that's going to determine our speed to doing that launch at this point um, is our engineering recruiting. We are currently actively recruiting engineers. Um, we have pretty high standards. And so, you know, we are taking our time in uh, and being picky. That being said, we are spending a significant amount of time. I'm personally spending a significant amount of time each week um, searching for good engineering recruits. And we do want to add more capacity. And that if we successfully do that, it will speed up the timeline to our mainnet launch. So that's the, the main bottleneck that we're up against. Um, and the reason I say that is because, you know, as everyone knows, the intention is to do the mainnet launch at a period where... Um, RSV is starting to get significant adoption and grow a significant amount. I believe that uh, we're going to achieve that in 2021. Um, and so at this point, I'm already planning ahead um, and working on engineering recruiting and um, sort of thinking through what that mainnet launch is going to look like. So that's what I can say about it. Um, maybe, you know, I think it's likely that we will announce a time frame, um, you know, before it happens, um, but we're not quite ready to yet. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Nevin, can you talk a little bit more about PayPal? Any connections there? Anything that's happening to PayPal? Yeah, I think I can say a little bit about that. Um, so we are, as we've said, we're in communication with PayPal um, and we are working with them with the aim of getting uh, sort of more significant approval for using PayPal as a liquidity mechanism to allow our users to cash in and cash out via PayPal. 
We've offered PayPal service to our users so far, um, but that's been done in a more informal way. Um, and we like there's no particular guarantee for um, that integration um, being approved, but we think that the odds are pretty good. And um, the timeline that PayPal has represented to us as being plausible um, is essentially in Q1 of this year. Um, I want to be 100% clear, though, that's not at all the same as PayPal itself adding um, either of our assets as being available in their app. That's a totally separate conversation. And, um, you know, we've raised the topic with PayPal, but what I can say about that is that um, they're not having serious conversations with any cryptocurrency project about that at this point. So PayPal isn't far enough along to have like a listing team um, and to be, you know, carefully evaluating um, additional assets. They've been fully focused on the initial launch of their product and seeing how that goes so far. Um, and But I think that it's plausible that they will end up thinking that way and looking to add more assets in 2021. Um, and so, you know, obviously we're interested in that conversation when the time comes, um, uh, but that's not something that they are discussing with any cryptocurrency project as of now. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask something? Go for it. Um, for now, the app is uh, based on uh, Android. Uh, how's the progress on the iOS? Yeah, so um, we, we developed the app with a, a platform called React Native, which allows you to deploy the code base, the same code base for both Android and iOS. However, it takes some additional effort um, to deploy to the second platform. And really what it, what, it, um, what it brings, the reason why we haven't done that yet, is that then you have to spend more time in an ongoing way, like fixing bugs and doing things to adapt everything to the second platform. And we just didn't want that additional overhead while we were in the mode of um, really sort of modifying and tweaking and iterating on our initial app. Um, and a good portion of users in our target markets are Android users. And so we, we sort of uh, kept that situation for efficiency. Excuse me. Um, we have already gone through the process to get our developer account with Apple set up. That can sometimes take a long time. So we've gotten that set up so that we can go ahead and do that deployment whenever we want to. Um, and so it's really not, it's not like there is an ongoing development process that has to finish before we will be ready to do it. We can choose to do it on relatively short notice when we're ready. Um, and we just, it's just a strategic decision. So um, we actually haven't decided exactly when we're gonna do that. Um, but I, you know, I'm very hungry to do it, of course, and so is the team. It's just a question of um, prioritization and making sure that we don't have too much to handle. So um, that's something that I anticipate happening relatively early in 2021. Um, and you know, I'll be excited when we can just actually make that announcement and and people can see it and play with it on an iPhone. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. Um, adding three stablecoin assets to Mitsa and R3 can be a little bit tedious for a lot of newbie investors and uh, can probably limit the scope of the size of this market. Is there any plans to create a system where you just add one asset and then the system on the back end will trade it into the stable assets to make it simpler for people to just deposit, say, for example, USDT or, say, only Ethereum? Bitcoin or something like that? Yeah, it's something that we've talked about. Um, we haven't prioritized it on the internal development team just because um, we've had we've had other things that we felt were more important for our near term goals. Um, it's it's cool. It's a cool idea. And I think that it will happen. Either we'll do it or um, external uh, teams will do it. Um, you know, if reserve gains in popularity the way that I believe it will, then I think that we'll see a lot of interesting uptake um, with, you know, all of the DAP developers that develop interesting things for DeFi protocols. With, uh, with RSV listed on Curve, um, that's like a pretty good trading venue that provides liquidity against a bunch of those other stable coins. So I believe that that DAP 
could be built today with that existing liquidity pool with with that curve um, infrastructure. Um, and so it's just a question of whether someone else builds a slick version of that before we end up prioritizing it or whether we end up doing it ourselves eventually. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen there, but I think it's a good idea. And I, I do believe that that will end up happening in the long run, probably sometime this year. success both in terms of number of users in the next few years as well as RSR market cap? Um, that's a good question. I don't I don't have a particular benchmark for RSR market cap. In terms of number of users in our initial target markets of Venezuela and Argentina internally on the team, we talk about getting to 10 million users um, in each country. That's that's kind of the, the benchmark for, okay, we've gotten really, really widespread adoption. Um, and that is what I am aiming us to achieve. Um, we, we certainly have smaller goals in the near term um, that we want to be focusing on. So like right now, um, we're, we're, you know, yeah, basically we have interim goals um, that, we're, that we're looking at as a team. But that's if we hit 10 million in Venezuela and or Argentina, um, that's what would cause me to declare, OK, we really succeeded um, in in that market. Yeah. Um, so in in recent months, we have not been particularly close contact with our investors, just because we've been in an implementation period um, where, uh, okay, this is like a process that often happens with a startup. So let me sort of say what's going on for us and kind of put it in context. Frequently, you know, you raise money, and then you have a period where your investors can be helpful primarily because they're referring you to other investors um, or early team members um, as you kind of do the initial assembly of the project. And that was a pattern that we had, you know, with Peter Thiel and Sam Altman and other investors of ours. Once you get to a point where you've kind of figured out um, your industry and your, and your technology and your product, you end up being like sort of an extreme expert um, on the particular thing that you're doing and it kind of stops making sense to talk to almost anyone because you figured out this really weird thing that you have to do. And for most people, like they wouldn't even understand why you're doing it. This is kind of like the, the weird details of the, our backend operations in Venezuela and so on. Um, and you have to spend a lot of time with your head down to make those things work. But if that all works um, and, and your product really clicks and starts to take off, then it starts to become useful to kind of put your eyes back out on the world and do a lot more in terms of, you know, thinking about business development and partnerships uh, um, and marketing and promotion and also a lot of hiring to scale your team. And so um, I anticipate that there will be a phase where we'll be sort of much more dependent on um, and appreciative of, you know, contact with and help from our investors, including Peter Thiel, um, you know, hopefully this year. I think that that is the phase that it looks like we are headed into. But for the past several months, um, we've been super heads down. You know, our investors contact us and we answer all their questions. Um, but, you know, I haven't even sent out an investor update um, to our seed investors for many, many months uh, because we've just been so focused on what we're doing. Thank you. Is there any that you should let's, um, let's, let's do, it looks like, Kevin wants to speak, and I think we haven't heard from him yet. So, Kevin, you want to go ahead? Oh, thanks, Nevin. Uh, so, are there plans for the team to get involved to like boost mainnet with DeFi adoption of RSV? Um. Okay. Okay. So, oh, I, I see your question. So, I, I think I think you're asking like post mainnet, will we be trying to get RSV integrated into DeFi? Yes. Maybe. Maybe. I go back and forth about this. Um. Really, the way I see it, there's a question of what opening is there? Like, is there something that we could do that would be really exciting, you know, that would cause really significant uptake um, and wouldn't be like a year long slog of us trying to um, to to get that benefit? Right. If there's something where we can deploy a couple of engineers for 
a month or two um, in order to execute on a plan that will sort of open doors and then cause a whole like a whole big flywheel to start running on its own then yes i would be excited about that i personally haven't spotted that i haven't seen a thing where okay this is a thing we could do that would actually change the DeFi game in a meaningful way that would cause a lot of people to be excited about using RSV instead of USDC or, or Tether or DAI or what have you in the DeFi space. Um, so, but my mind remains open to that. Um, and, and, and the thing is, I think it's actually, it's really tempting because there's obviously so much activity in DeFi. Um, there's so much capital sloshing around. And so it's like, ah, oh, well, you know, maybe we could get like, you know, a bunch of gains in market cap if we just promoted the thing as being, you know, a stable coin used in DeFi. But the way I see it, um, you know, we've been making the pretty strong bet that um, there's actually this much bigger um, and much more important market out there that almost no one in crypto has really even started to reach, which is, you know, people who actually need cryptocurrency to live in an important way and who don't have the infrastructure built for them yet. And so that's really what we've, the bet we've been making when building this app and when focusing on uh, people in Venezuela and Argentina who aren't part of crypto is that, you know, actually if we ignore DeFi, that could be um, the most advantageous thing for the project because, you know, we've gone and understood this whole thing that most crypto projects haven't really understood and built this whole infrastructure. So we'll see, we'll start to see in 2021 if that bet is paying off the way that I believe it will. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe it'll take till 2022 or 2023 to, to really like fully enjoy um, the, the like really significant boost that I believe that could cause. Um, uh, but so that's why I've been, I've tried to be as disciplined as possible in not taking on what could balloon into a really resource intensive um, DeFi sort of angle. Um, but we sort of, we, we do remain open-minded um, to basically providing basic Lego infrastructure if we see a case where we think there would be a lot of uptake um, with, you know, where we're still able to spend the vast majority of our time focusing on the specific play that we've decided is the best. Thanks for the thorough answer. Yeah. How has the uh, pandemic affected the, I guess, growth or communication between the reserve team uh, across all the countries? Yeah, that's a good question. So we had already started operating as a pretty remote team because of the fact that we had been hiring in Latin America. Um, so we had a situation where, you know, we had our main office in uh, in the Bay Area, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but then we had started to have a bunch of remote employees. So we had already kind of started to practice how to work well um, as a remote team. But Honestly, it was the, part of the challenge of that is if you have a bunch of people in an office and then also a bunch of people who are remote, there ends up kind of being a divide because the people in the office are able to hang out with each other and sort of um, do the informal thing you do in person. Um, and so the people who are remote constantly feel like they're kind of left out. They're kind of not up to date. And so interestingly, and, and I didn't anticipate this, it's just, you know, just happenstance, once um, the pandemic hit, we went fully remote, so we said, okay, everyone's gonna work from home. And because of that, you know, our digital communication methods that you know almost every team uses of, of Slack and Zoom um, and Discord um, ended up being the office, right? And so that actually makes it so that there really isn't anyone who's cut off because all the communication is actually happening via those virtual mechanisms. And so it presents an interesting choice for us of what should we do um, once all of this winds down, uh, you know, and there is the opportunity to have um, a, a big office, um, should we do that? Should we try to centralize the team? Um, you know, we have team members in many different countries in Latin America at this point, as well as across the US. And honestly, I don't know. So I, I tend to think the default is to stay fully remote because we've really learned to do that as a team. And it actually works pretty well, maybe even better than a kind of mix of remote um, and local. But you know, I really love being in person with people and the amount of like sort of connection you get um, and, uh, and and what can happen from that. So what I think is if we do stay fully remote, um, the thing that I've been thinking is that it would make sense to get the entire team together for like maybe two weeks at a time, maybe twice a year to make sure that they're getting that human connection because I think that's an important part of people being able to work together. Um, but we're kind of still thinking about that and figuring that out. 
Thanks, Nathan. Just a quick question. I mean, you know, look, I have a very formidable network that could probably add a lot of strategic value to reserve, and I'm sure some other people listening do too. What can we do to add more value to you and, and the company? Um, you know, with our networks besides just chilling on Twitter and hashtagging RSR. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I mean, I do appreciate the promotion on Twitter. I feel like uh, I've been really impressed <laughs> with the amount of that that happens. You know, with us not causing any of it. Um, the the one thing that I'll say there, um, which I mentioned previously, is that you know we do have a bottleneck of engineering recruiting. So if you have um, if you have effective engineers in your network, um, we'd be interested to at least look at their LinkedIn um, and GitHub, and then maybe schedule a meeting with them. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about what we're looking for. So we can take on engineers right now who are excited about smart contract development on Ethereum, or who are excited about sort of full stack mobile and web development uh, because our current engineers, many of them can do both. Um, and, and so um, we sort of can take on engineers who are interested in either in order to speed up our overall progress. Um, we generally are looking for quite senior people, you know, 10 plus years of experience. Um, we will take on junior people if they're like really fantastic, um, but we tend to favor senior people um, just because, you know, more experience means it's easier to make decisions and do things faster um, with making less mistakes. We're open to hiring people anywhere in the world. We favor, um, uh, you know, North America and South America because of time zones. But if we find the right person um, in Asia uh, or, or somewhere else, we will definitely consider them. So um, if you know engineers um, who you think could be a good fit and who might be interested in what we're doing, um, I would really, really appreciate referrals. Uh, one one piece of that is um, I'm doing an experiment right now, which some of you may have seen, which is uh, the Reserve Referral Tracker Telegram group. Um, it's kind of a weird thing. Um, so let me try to explain a little bit about what it is and how it could help our engineering recruiting. So um, the way that this referral tracking mechanism works is if somebody refers an engineer that we hire, um, in this case, this is for a web developer position, so not our main engineering recruiting, but just um, like a, a general web developer. If someone refers a developer that we hire, then they get a reward. In this case, I think it's 50,000 RSR. If you refer someone to the referral tracker, and then that person refers a web developer that we hire, then you get half that, you get 25,000 uh, RSR. If you refer someone, and they refer someone else, and then that person refers someone that we hire, you still get um, this uh, half again, so you get 12 and a half K, and that goes on forever. So basically, if you are part of the chain of referrals where you brought us someone who brought us someone who brought us an engineer, um, you'll get a part of that bounty. And this, the point of the experiment is to see, can we, can we motivate people in the community who are interested in receiving RSR um, to basically to search through their network and not only refer people that they are directly friends with who could be an engineer, um, but refer people that they know who are very connected, who could refer an engineer, because they would still get a part of that compensation if that connection of theirs refers someone to us. So far, um, we've gotten, I think, seven referrals for web developers over the past couple of days through this, so that's a little bit promising, um, but we haven't seen very many people referring friends of theirs who might refer further. And so I'm gonna see if we can figure out a way to do that. Um, this simple version on Telegram was just because that's something I could set up in 10 minutes. Um, but we are considering basically uh, uh, recruiting a web developer in order to build a website that does this sort of referral mechanism in a more official way where you can show up to a website and read about a position, read about how this mechanism works, um, and then generate a referral link that you can share with your friends and if people click that link to join this process, that's tracked and you're part of the chain. Um, and so I, I'm saying all this because um, the, you know, th this initial experiment that's meant to bring us a web developer, that's not meant to grow our generalized engineering team, but that web developer um, will likely, <laughs> their first task will be building this for their website. Um, and if that project works out, it could actually be a really useful networking tool and over the next you know, year um, could actually significantly accelerate our engineering recruiting because a lot of the cost 
of recruiting is, is manually searching for the right kinds of people. Um, this is something where uh, if we can mobilize the whole reserve community via this incentive mechanism, um, then maybe that can reduce the amount of time that the core team has to spend searching for people. So um, if you're curious, if you want to help, you know, and you don't have someone in your network immediately who um, is, uh, who sounds like they could be one of the top engineers we're looking for, something you can do that still might contribute to our recruiting process is to go join that um, referral, uh, referral tracker group and then refer friends of yours who are well connected um, who might bring us a web developer and thus kick off that process. Nevin, that's all. Nevin, that's all. Just want to say quickly that I work in recruitment, but we don't do engineers. I think you should talk to Rod Mayon at Proof of Talent. He's got a very deep network of engineers. He's also a personal friend, and if you want to be connected to him, I'm happy to introduce you. Cool, yeah. If you could send me, just send me, uh, why don't you send me his LinkedIn profile, and I'll check that out. I appreciate that. For sure. I'll send you a DM right now. Cool. Uh, yeah, let's go with uh, let's go with Jack because I think uh, we haven't heard from Jack yet. Hello, mate. Um, moving forward, do you have any legitimate concerns that some more prominent economies might fall into some kind of hyper inflation, or is that in your scope? Bro? So you were cutting out a little bit. Let me check that I understood the question. Are you saying, um, you know, are we are we thinking about? Are we concerned about the possibility that um, uh, larger, like more established economies could actually go into hyperinflation, like, like the US dollar or like, you know, the euro or something. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, either hyperinflation or, or something of that nature. Maybe it's just kind of hyperinflation. Right. Um, it's definitely something that we think about a little bit. Um, it's definitely something that we anticipate happening um, over the course of time from time to time. The way that, let me see, how do I put this? Um, so I buy into the idea that um, empires on earth uh, rise and fall, sort of the, the number one empire rises and falls, and you see these cycles that last, you know, some number of hundreds of years, and that um, the US is in a period of decline. And so um, it may be overtaken and not be the dominant power, you know, sometime this century. Um, and that if that happens, it is likely that the US dollar will lose its reserve currency status um, and could have a very painful unwinding and devaluation as people switch away from holding it um, to holding whatever new currency takes its place. Um, and so there's an interesting question of like, well, how close are we to that kind of situation where the US dollar is actually ceasing to be the reserve currency. I don't think that that's something that we're necessarily like on the precipice for that you would expect to see this year. Um, although some people think that that could actually be in the process of happening. Um, I personally don't think so right now. Um, it would be hard to tell. It, it'd be really hard to tell something like that in advance. Um, but it's something that could be happening, uh, you know, in a decade and two decades. And that is part of the purpose of this project. So part of the purpose of the project is to create a totally state independent currency um, that maintains stable purchasing power even through situations like that. Um, and so it's something that um, is a kind of a deeper motivation for us is to, to end up creating a currency. And, and the way that I think about it, you know, if we were to fully succeed what we would be offering is a stable cryptocurrency that would stay stable forever, um, you know, or sort of for the foreseeable future. And what that could mean, and you know, this is obviously is going out on a limb, we don't know how these sorts of events would play out, but what that could mean is you could actually have the fall of the US dollar from being the reserve currency, um, and people could adopt um, the, the reserve, you know, RSV as the main currency to transact in because that would be a period in history where people were seeing, oh, wow, even things like the dollar can totally unwind. Um, maybe there's a reason to actually adopt something else and use a different system. Um, so that is something we think about um, in terms of like, you know, near term effects from, you know, from the monetary policy executed within the pandemic on, you know, the dollar, the euro, or the yen, etc. Um, I don't personally have any reason to suspect 
um, you know, really significant inflation, um, maybe that will happen. But um, it's not something that we are that we're currently um, trying to capitalize on or, or expecting in a big way. Um, so right now we are really at this point in the project, we're still really mostly focused on offering you know, virtual access to the U.S. dollar, essentially, uh, to people who are in countries that have high inflation and, and capital controls um, and have trouble getting access to it now, which kind of we think is the right way to get a foothold for, for this project. And it looks like um, we're coming up on the end of the hour, so we have time for maybe one, maybe two more questions. Um, so let's go ahead and, and hear from people who haven't asked a question so far. So if you haven't asked a question yet, um, you feel free to jump in and, and ask one now. Hi there, uh, Nevin. Thanks very much for like, taking the time to actually uh, sort of speak to your community. It's actually massively appreciated. Um, I've just got a general question actually, just about um, how Reserve actually um, targets sort of the the next countries which they'd look to launch the the product itself within. Because I've recently read, I think China or Nigeria, uh, not China, sorry, Nigeria and uh, Turkey were potentially on your on your list. Um, do you to sort of talk, talk a bit to that point and also about the general stages which would happen um, from reserve sites to actually um, look to go into these sort of new, uh, new or like, you know, yeah, new target countries? Yep, totally. So, um, you know, we kind of have our eye on parts of the world that are dealing with, um, you know, high inflation and capital controls are the main indicators. Um, and the process really, so, so there's a couple things. So one is that, you know, we, we do try not to get ahead of ourselves. We really want to um, sort of prove and, and perfect the model in a small enough number of places before we start to spread everywhere. We kind of use the metaphor of what Uber and Lyft did, where it's like, okay, make it work in San Francisco. Once you have the system working, then try to replicate it in other US cities. Once you have that working and you have your system for replication, then try to replicate in other countries around or other yeah other countries around the world. So we're kind of thinking about it similarly. Where for us, Venezuela is kind of our San Francisco, um, and Argentina is you know I don't know it's kind of like our LA or something wherever they went next. Um, and so um, so we do try to be cautious. That being said, you know we do sort of keep an eye on other places that could be relevant. Um, so like, for instance, yesterday I had a call um, with uh, someone from Lebanon who's a contact of ours, you know, who's in the crypto industry. And, you know, we do keep tabs on the situation there, understanding what's happening with government policy around exchange and what's happening on the ground and that sort of thing. Um, the, the process for um, starting out in a new country, the, part of the way that we designed the app was to make that actually relatively simple to do on an experimental basis. So we can um, onboard, you know, just a single payment processor in a country in order to open up that currency pair. Um, we can do, you know, maybe a tiny social media splash or buy a few ads on Facebook to get, you know, a few hundred initial um, alpha testers um, and start to see how do people behave in that market. So that's something where we can do a relatively lightweight experiment if we decide to. Um, but what I'll say is that um, I think that our our um, I don't want to use the word success because we haven't succeeded yet, but like our progress in Venezuela in particular, um, I attribute very heavily to having been able to recruit um, one person who um, really has a, a founding mindset, really has a lot of experience, a lot of the relevant connections. I don't name this person publicly. We keep their identity private um, for various reasons. Um, but um, that person was then able to you know, lead us in that market and, um, and also recruit a fantastic team um, based on existing connections um, and new people that we've been able to find to the point where you know, well over half of our team is Venezuelan um, and a good portion of those people are in Venezuela um, really because we found the correct person to lead that part of the project. And that is, an, in my book, that is an essential component of succeeding in a new country that you're not from is really finding the appropriate leader for that part of the project. And so honestly, I think that the biggest like determining factor that will cause us to say, okay, now is the right time to really start um, in Lebanon or you know in um, any of these other countries like the ones you referenced um, is going to be, you know, when do we find that person for each place? 
And that's something where we are passively looking like on on my call with our Lebanon contact yesterday, I did, you know, ask that question again, you know, who do you know? Do you know anyone who could refer us, etc. So we are sort of sniffing around. Um, but you kind of never know when you're going to bump into the right person. <clears throat> um, and so that's a, a big factor that will end up determining that timeline. Um, and it looks like we're at the end of the hour. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. But judging by the number of people listening, um, I think that this was a success. I think that this was a good use of time. I feel like we got to talk about several interesting topics. Um, and I think we're going to see if we can write up some of these answers um, in, a, in an AMA format in order to spread the information further. So thanks everyone for doing this. This, this was fun, fun for me. You know, it's, it's, it's like kind of like a podcast, but much more interesting because, uh, the audience can actually ask questions live. It's pretty, pretty cool. So, um, appreciate everyone joining and, uh, we will likely end up doing this, um, again and maybe on a regular basis. So I'll, I'll talk to you all soon. Nevin, thank you so much. And please check thank you. that link. All right. Uh, thank you. All right. Sounds good. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Yeah, you guys are welcome.